Today is July 11th, 2014. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I will be interviewing Larry, um, Larry Ziegler um, in Springfield, Illinois, at the American Legion Conference Convention. Um, Rita Corson will be the court reporter, and um, Mr. Ziegler, can you tell me for the record? what uh, your birth date is? 11-20-47. And where were you born? Savannah, Illinois. Savannah, Illinois. Good. Okay. Who were your parents? What were their names? Howard and Pauline Ziegler. Okay. And what did your parents do? For My birth? mother and father both worked for the U.S. government okay. at the Savannah Army Depot in Savannah, Illinois. What did they do there? My father was in transportation at first, and then he uh, was uh, a ammunition and hazardous waste expert for the last years that he was in. He traveled all over the world as an instructor for the Army. My mother was a human resource professional that uh, went back to work after she raised four boys. So my dad had 42 years of government service, and my mother had 25 years of government service. How many siblings did you have? I have three younger brothers. I'm the oldest of four brothers. Did any of them go into the military? Uh, yes, my brother Terry served in the U.S. Army. Okay. My other two brothers, my one brother did, didn't have to go because, I, because he had a physical <clears throat> ailment. Uh, so and my last brother didn't have to go because of the war was over by then. So. And what branch of service were you in? The U.S. Air Force. Okay. And what made you join the U.S. Air Force? Well, it's kind of a funny story. I was going to join the Navy like my father because he was in World War II. When I went over to see the recruiter over in Freeport, Illinois, uh, he didn't show up. So I got a little irritated, and I went next door and joined the Air Force. So my dad said, are you sure? I said, yes. And what years of service what years were you in the service? I was in from 12, 27, 66 to 10, 17, 71. Four years and ten months, approximately. Um, what made you um, want to join the service? Well, I was number 13 on the draft list, and I really didn't want to get drafted, so I decided to enlist. Another reason was to uh, pursue an education when I got out, so I'd have the GI Bill, plus to serve my country. So. What were you doing bef when you joined the service? Uh, I was working in a factory in my hometown of Hanover, Illinois. So, okay. um, where did you take your basic um, military training? Uh, my basic training. What happened was I was on my way to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and. We got transferred to Amarillo, Texas because of an outbreak of spinal meningitis. So I, instead of going to San Antonio, Texas, I went to Amarillo, Texas, the Dust Bowl of the South. So that's the reason. So I had six weeks and then I was there for approximately two extra months waiting on a top secret security clearance because I was in the Air Force Security Service. So. Okay, so what was your... Um Advanced training, top secret? No, my my training was in administration. I was like a human resource specialist, so I had uh, I had to go to school for that, and then um, I had a security clearance because I dealt with classified information when I was stationed overseas. Okay. And how long was that training? About six weeks, so it didn't last very long. Okay. So going back to your basic training. How did you get there? You mean what route did I take? Did you fly? I flew. You, you yes. flew? Yes. Okay. So. And they r routed you? Rerouted us to uh, uh, Amarillo. Okay. So um, you're getting off the plane. Did huh? you take a take a bus to the... We took, a, we took a bus to the base. Okay. What did you think when you got off that bus? I said, uh, where am I? And so... I was just 19, so, you know, first time I'd ever been away from home. So it was a new experience, but uh, I was kind of a, 
I was kind of roused about when I was a kid, but I, once I got there and it looked at everything and made a lot of friends that I just kind of settled in. So it wasn't bad. So I, um, when I first had basic training, I, I could, I had a hard time marching. Everybody does, but eventually I caught on. So I'd call my dad just to rib and say, oh, they're going to kick me out of the Air Force. I can't march. And he'd laugh. So I, I made it fun, but it was also very serious. But I made a lot of friends. I have a picture of all my buddies that I served with in basic training. They made us take pictures. And then everybody had to sign their name on the back of the picture. I still have it at home. And I can probably identify about half the people. Did you stay in contact with any of them? <clears throat> a couple for a while. Nick Bradford and uh, another one was uh, <clears throat> a guy from the... Uh, East Coast, I uh, can't think of his name right now, but uh, he and I were stationed together in Germany for a while. So anyway, at least two, so. Okay. So after your advanced training, where did, did you get a um, leave? No, I stayed in Amarillo until my security clearance came through and then I had a leave of 30 days. And then from there I went to Peshawar, West Pakistan for 15 months. What was that like? It was hot. Desolate, not a whole lot to do. Uh, when I first went there and got off the plane, it was hot. And uh, wasn't a whole lot to do there other than drink. Never drank before I went over there. That got old. So anyway, I made the best of it. Uh, a lot of service club activities. Uh, made a lot of friends. Uh, did a lot of different things. Traveled into town in, in the town of Peshawar. So I did a little bit of everything to keep busy. Took a couple classes to the University of Maryland that they offered, so it was it was different, but uh, just had to adapt to the surroundings. And uh, we worked. Uh, I worked uh, days, so uh, it wasn't bad. I had uh, two roommates, one from Georgia and one from I think Washington D.C. So anyway, uh, it was it was a unique experience. So. Now, was it a big base that you were on? Or? It was fairly good size. It was supposed to be a, a, a super secret base, but it wasn't. My mom sent me an article from the, from the place that it was going to close later or something like that, but uh, she sent me an article. So as far as the designation of being a uh, super secret military installation, I don't think it was. So it was out in the middle of nowhere. There was marijuana growing around the outside of the wall. There were lizards and if you, you didn't want to venture out there, there were snakes poisonous snakes so I don't think anybody ever ventured out to the outside of the wall because of that so there were big animals too so anyway it was uh, not recommended so so you basically stayed on base well no we could we could go off base during the day you know up to downtown but at night we had to go in groups of four because the town was at, in some areas was unsafe so we could venture out during the day with no problems. They had a bus that took us back and forth to the base. And then at night, we had to go in groups of four, like I said. So it was, uh, like I said, it's, I adapted it all right. Uh, I look forward to getting mail, you know, once a week from my mom and dad. So that was the big thing was the mail call. And sometimes the mail didn't come in on time for various reasons. So anyway, um, but like I said, uh, made a lot of friends. What else did I do? Oh, I took a couple. Oh, I took a karate class, played basketball, so I did all kinds of sports activities. So that kept me busy. What was your barracks like? Oh, they were they weren't bad. Uh, it was air conditioned uh, when the power wasn't off. We got our power from Kabul, Afghanistan, before the Russians invaded it. But you might go to might go to sleep at night just right and wake up the next morning in. Wait a minute. What was that? Was the light go off automatically? Well, anyway, you might wake up the next morning in a sweat because the power had gone out. So you never knew. One minute it'd be cold, just right. The next minute you wake up in a sweat. Was it? Did you have mattresses? And yeah, we had a bed. We each had our own bed. Mm -hmm. So three beds in a room. Uh, some rooms are only big enough for two beds. We had uh, bears. They called them. That cleaned our rooms for $2 a month, pretty cheap. We paid them in rupees. If you bought something in town or you wanted it picked up, they'd go in and pick it up for you on their bikes and bring it back the next day and you give them 
couple of rupees, like five to ten rupees is what I gave the bearers. And they were happy with that. They were poor. So, but they cleaned our barracks every day, shined our shoes, did whatever we wanted. What kind of things did you buy in town? Oh, I bought a couple of suits and I bought a couple of pair of desert boots, took them home with me. So, sharkskin suits were popular back then, you know, they were kind of bright and shiny. So I had a gray one and I think I had a blue one. So that was one of the things we did, but that was, uh, we didn't spend much time in town. There wasn't a whole lot to do. We sh you could shop around, but it was a poor, poor country and the town itself didn't have a lot to offer. I mean, it was huge, but uh, people would come up to you and tug at you and want money, things like that. So, but like I said, <laughs> it's a unique experience, so. What about um, <clears throat> eating? What kind of food did you eat over there? Well, it, it, American food, what we ate in the chow hall, or sometimes uh, we had places on the base like uh, NCO Club where you could eat, order steak, we had to pay for it. But So mainly it was a chow hall where they fixed the food for you. It, it was okay. And then different, you could eat at the NCO club. We had an airman's club too that they started while I was there that you could go down, go down and get something like a hamburger or something like that. And it was pretty cheap. So. Did you go anywhere besides Pakistan? Uh, uh, I went to a, a couple of places called Karachi, which is the capital, and uh, another one called Dhaka, uh, just to see what it was like. So. I was going to go to the Khyber Pass, but I never made it. And I was going to go to Kabul, but I never made it either. So, so yeah, I went to a couple places. Um, when I first got there, they I spent the night in Karachi. Then the next morning, I took the bus out to the base. And then when I left Pakistan to go to Germany, I sp spent the, another night in the uh, hotel, same hotel, and then flew out. Went home first on a leave, and then went to Germany, Frankfurt, Germany, for three years. So... And how, how long did you get a leave? 30 days. So uh, anyway, um, went home, saw, saw everybody that I knew, and then um, went to Germany late, let's see, 68, late 68, somewhere around there. It's hard to remember. I was in Pakistan for 15 months, 67, 68. So that Germany was a lot nicer. And how long were you there? Approximately three years. So. Um, I was single then. Well, I was single, you know, until I was about 24. Anyway, but it was, we were right on Main Street. We lived on, well, you won't be able to spell this, Eschenheimer Landstrasse. But anyway, uh, we were right in the heart of downtown Frankfurt. And uh, so everything was, PX was right across the street where you could buy stuff. The liquor store was close. So everything was pretty close. We could take the uh, train downtown. That's when, back then, that's when discotheques were popular. So on the weekends, we'd go downtown, you know, and raise a little hell. And, dance and have a good time so there were there were a lot of things to do in Germany so um, the best thing was that the, the change was nice uh, I had to extend an extra year in order to get that assignment otherwise I'd have gotten out in four years but uh, I decided well might as well so when they when they asked me to re-enlist uh, late when I was getting out I told them I wanted embassy duty in Australia but I knew I wouldn't get it but I thought well I'll try he said, well, we'll send you back stateside. I said, I don't want to go back stateside. So I ended up getting out. So anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a good experience. I enjoyed, enjoyed, enjoyed the military. So. Now, what did you do while you were in Germany? What was your assignment? Uh, same thing, administration. I handled uh, classified information. Um, we were, we had to have badges to get in and out of, we'd bring a, buzzer and they buzz us in and we had badges so it was a it was a security service type operation where you had to have a clearance and a badge to get in and out so when you left you gave your badge to the guard and left and when you came back he'd give you your badge and you wear it you know and go into your respective office and stuff like that so it was kind of neat so um, it was different handling classified information you had to be careful and, uh, you know so became kind of like second nature. You just got used to it. You see a top secret message, you go, oh. So there were different, there were different uh, categories of uh, top secret. You know, some were more important than others, but most of the time you, the three were like confidential, secret, top secret. So the classifications varied depending on the uh, type of information. So it, it, uh, 
I worked different shifts. I'd work the early morning shift, and then sometimes I worked the afternoon shift, but mainly I worked in the morning. It's like having a civilian job, like nine to five or eight to four. So weekends, uh, oh, we had I played baseball. We had a we had a uh, baseball team, softball team. Uh, sometimes we had to do what they call CQ, where we'd have to be up 24 hours, charge your quarters, you know, take messages, be like being on guard duty. So. That happened, I think, two or three times. So, anyway, anything? I... Did you live on base? Then? No, no, we lived off base. We lived right in downtown Frankfurt. Okay. We, we had a barracks, and uh, when I first got there, it was really good. But uh, we had a first sergeant, and uh, he, we, they basically remodeled the, the place. We got refrigerators, put in carpet and stuff, so it made it more homey than when I first got there. I mean, it was okay. I mean, it was clean. We had inspections once a week. And then as time progressed, that kind of changed. So I remember I was put in charge of our particular area. There was a two-star general coming through. And so uh, we had to do cleaner rooms and spit shine and everything. So I was designated as the uh, barracks chief for that day. And so the two-star general came in, but he only looked at one room and left, you know, saluted him. And uh, anyway, so that was that. So, but it was, it was fun. I met, I had a lot of friends over there and uh, I was single. So, you know, I had a German girlfriend and so it was fun. She taught me to speak German a little bit. So it was, a, it was, it was a good experience for me all around. So. So did you eat it in? Oh, I had German. Yeah. You had to get used to drinking uh, German beer at room temperature. That was tough, but. And, oh, yeah, ate a lot of German food, sauerkraut, brats, you know. So you get tired of that, though. But uh, you could go downtown and get a variation of food. Being there allowed me to travel to different places, like it was only a four-hour drive to Amsterdam. And so went to Amsterdam, and a friend of mine and his family and I, we traveled to, uh, Ger or to London and different places when she came over with her mother. He was, he was my roommate from Texas. His name was Larry. So we had, we had a good time. So yeah, I did, did a lot of traveling. Went to the Grand Prix of Monaco. So I went to, been to Nice, France and different places. So being in Germany allowed me to do a lot of different things, you know. And uh, so a buddy of mine had a car, so we'd go places on the weekends. It just just depend on the weather. But uh, it, the weather was typical in the Midwest, cold in the winter. And, Summers were hot, so the climate was somewhat the same. Did you learn to ski over there? No, I, I learned to ski after I got out of the service. So I worked at a ski lodge up in Chestnut, up in Galena for four years, so part-time. So mm -hmm. no, I learned after I got back, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was fun. I have no regrets about being in the service. So it, it, it actually helped me grow up because I was kind of a, Oh, I don't know, an immature kid, but the service kind of provided a stepping stone for me as far as what I wanted to do. And and so it, it helped me a lot. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And they paid for my education and things like that. So I, like I said, I was glad to serve my country. And uh, it's nice to be recognized. You know, a lot of people today, thank you for your service. I mean, they didn't do that back in the olden days, like after World War II. So it's nice. I mean, I, I'm glad to be involved in the Legion. I'm also a lifetime member of the VFW plus a lifetime member of the Legion. So, um, <clears throat> see, did you stay in touch with um, your family and friends, and how did you stay in touch with them Mail. in Germany? Oh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, I was there. How did I keep in touch with my parents and stuff? Mm -hmm. Just via mail, and uh, that was it. You look forward to mail and things like that. That was the main way, you know. And send, my mom would send me cookies, and Christmas time was bad. But the nice thing about being over there and working for this one gentleman, his name was Chuck. I they would he would invite me over there for Thanksgiving and Christmas. So at least I spent some time with some friends and then my boss, regular boss, I would babysit for him and his two kids. And so anyway, I, I kept busy and uh, some weekends were longer than others. Holidays were bad, you know, cause you wish you could be home with your uh, 
family and things like that. But I made the best of it. Did you have you stayed in touch with any of those people from Germany? Uh, no, not really. At first I did. I, I stayed in touch with my old boss, but I lost track of him. Yeah, I, after I left Germany, uh, I don't know. I don't know if he. I don't remember where he went, but I think he may have retired after I left. So uh, I tried to look him up. Oh yeah, no, I did. Oh, take that back. We were. I was in San Antonio on a trip, and I ended up uh, calling my old boss. I just have I have a good memory for names, and so I found his name and called him. And I was going to go see him, but never got around to it. And then my old boss that I knew, named Finley, uh, he lives in San Antonio, so I called him. So googled his name and got remember he and his wife used to have me over to their house and stuff. So when I called, why Leslie remembered me as Crazy Larry. So anyway. Yeah, I did stay in touch with those two. But other than that, uh, oh yeah, Larry Baker was one of my best friends. He and I got, he got discharged the day before I did. So I was out to, uh, he lives in Portland, Oregon. So I was out there about three, four years ago and stopped and saw him. So both three people, but Larry's the one I mainly stayed in contact with. Uh, I went to California about a year later to see him for a week and stayed at his parents' house. So yeah, I, I guess I did keep, keep active with about three or four people. Did you um, go to any reunions? Uh, no, haven't been to any. They, we, I don't know. We just didn't know. It takes somebody that, you know, is willing to do the work and things like that. It's like the old World War II guys. I mean, they meet every, some meet every year, some meet every five years. But no, nobody really took the initiative to try and get back together. I mean, I had the picture of all the people back home. I could probably look at the names and probably Google some of them and find them. But no, no. So... Um, coming home, do you remember being discharged and where you were and how you got home? Yeah, I was discharged at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Um, had to stay overnight and processed out the next morning and then went to the uh, Philadelphia airport and then flew to Dubuque, Iowa. And when I got there, my parents were there to welcome me home. I don't know if welcome's a good word, but no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so, um, so yeah, so then I lived at home. For about four years, After, then I went to then I got married, went to school on the GI Bill. I only had five years left. You get ten years to use it, and so I got paid a monthly stipend to go to school and things like that. Uh, so it was it was. <laughs> I thought you were swatting flies there for a minute, but anyway. Okay. Hey, let's see. I guess that's it. I mean, that last question I think I answered. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Um, yep. So um, you used the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. You went to school. What, what, did you get a degree? Yeah, I got an associate's at Carl Sandburg College in Galesburg, Illinois. And then I went on to Western and got my Bachelor of Business. And then I got my MBA at Western Illinois University and I, went, and I got a, an advanced degree called an EDS, which is an Educational Development Specialist degree in Community College Administration. So then I ended up after that, uh, worked in a tire factory for five years and then when I was married, why Sharon talked me into going back to school. So we were driving by the campus in Galesburg, Illinois, and it was brand new. And I said, that's where I want to go to school and that's where she was from, so she was happy. And what did you do after you went back to school? Uh, I worked part-time at the school. Basically, I went to school full-time. I didn't have any kids then, and so I was a full-time student. Uh, just average. I wasn't, you know, so I was like in high school. I didn't set the world on fire. I kind of I kind of messed around and didn't apply myself. And so when I went back to school, I was a, an older adult. I was 30 years old when I went back to college. I put a little more effort into it. But I, would, I was a uh, community college teacher, so I always used to tell the kids if I can get a college degree, anybody can. So, anyway, so yeah, so I, I enjoyed it. I got that, and I just went right. I commuted back and forth from Galesburg to Western for three years, so it was a lot of driving, but it was worth the effort. So, paid off. Um, how did you, your experience in the service affect your life? Oh, it, it helped me mature. It kind of gave me a, a plan on, as to what direction I wanted to go. But 
basically, uh, when I went in, I was, like I said, I was immature, and uh, it just provided a little, gave me a better focus of what I wanted to do. It kind of put me on the road to where I am today. So it, it provided structure for me more okay. than anything. Have you retired? Yes, I retired in 2010 from teaching. I taught at Highland Community College in Freeport, Illinois for 28 years. So, What are some um, life lessons you learned with uh, the military service? Not to volunteer. No, I, I learned that it's, it's an honor to serve your country and uh, it I met a lot of nice people along the way. I learned a lot of things about uh, administration. Um, I learned about how about having fun. I learned about all kinds of life experiences that there's too many to mention. But uh, it was just about you know doing your job and, and meeting people and, and serving and uh, serving with distinction, and being honorably discharged. So. Have you been back to Pakistan or? No, I've been, no, I was back to Germany twice with the uh, WIU Jazz Band. They had uh, a tour in 97 and 01, so I went on that. And so yeah, I did go back, but no, I wouldn't want to go back to Pakistan now. So I never thought about going back there, but uh, I was glad I got to go over. I mean, it was a unique experience, hotter than hell, but you know, so. I got used to the heat and the humidity. And uh, I had a friend of mine, he and I went over together, and he said, you watch, I'll be out of here in a little while. And he pretended like he was nuts, and they, just, <laughs> they shipped him out, but he wasn't any more nuts than I was. So he, he got out, he says, you watch. And he did, they shipped him out. Just pretended like he was crazy. But they, a lot of people couldn't take the type of atmosphere, you know, that was there. And uh, it, it was tough duty. I mean, you had, had to have a good mindset in order to survive. But like I said, I had a lot of friends and that helped. You know, we play cards and watched, one much to watch over there as far as TV. They had Armed Forces Radio, that helped. Armed Forces Radio and Television. We used to get the Stars and Stripes, the paper. So there were a lot of things that the Air Force provided. Uh, I wouldn't call Pakistan a best duty assignment in the world, but uh, you know, like I said, it uh, helped me mature and kind of provided the focus of uh, what I wanted to do. Even when I got out, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I, I got into teaching by accident, but it was a good thing for me. So and I didn't want to work in a factory the rest of my life. So like going back to school, it, it, it gave, me, uh, gave me an out, and uh, I decided to just make the best of it. Ended up being a teacher, so... How has your military service impacted war? your feelings um, about war and the military in general? Well, I don't, I don't agree with all the policies that are set forth by the military, but um, if you, I always used to tell my students, if you don't have a plan, you know, go into the military, at least provide some, some type of education for you and may provide a career path for you that you haven't chosen and may give you something to do. And, you know, you don't want to sit around forever on your parents' couch and become a couch potato. But um, if you're called upon to serve your country, I think you have an obligation, a duty. Um, I don't like to discuss politics, but, you know, all wars are different. Uh, I didn't like the fact that we lost a lot of lives in all the various wars, but it's part of our society today. You know, that seems to be the... Uh, rule of thumb as far as, well, if you don't get something, then you kill for it. But So anyway, the, the military to me is uh, an honor and an obligation, but uh, not every not every person would agree with my feelings on that. So, What message would you like to leave in future generations who will view this interview? I would just say um, from a, from a military perspective if you have a chance to serve your country serve with honor and distinction and do your best um, my my philosophy is that the service provided a uh, career path for me and i ended up being more successful than i thought i would be so i'm grateful for that i'm grateful for the gi bill i'm grateful for all the friends i met and 
I'm grateful to have experienced all the things that I did in the military. So, it, it, it it's been a uh, it's been a delightful experience for me and a fun ride. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, Besides the GI Bill, did you use any other benefits? The uh, Illinois Military Scholarship paid for my tuition. So that was one of that's the nice thing about the state of Illinois, and they don't charge and they don't uh, on my pension they don't uh, charge any state income tax. So that's why a lot of people come to Illinois. Well, I don't know about now, but a lot of veterans live in Illinois because they're not taxed on their retirement, and that there's not many states like that. So there are there are advantages and disadvantages to living in the state of Illinois. So anyway, that's one of them. And uh, um, I, I I like I drive the VA van a couple times a month to Iowa City and take veterans, and uh, so. Uh, you see a lot of different things, you know, so I feel sorry for the people that have, you know, been through the war and stuff like that. I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't have to go over to Vietnam or anything like that. So I'm grateful when I got out that, it, you know, that I, um, I mean, I served my country and, and did what I was told and got honorably discharged. So I'm, I'm happy with what I did. How did you learn about um, the Illinois not? Uh, oh, I, I talked to some people. Um, a friend of mine was discharged from the Army. This was after I got out of the Air Force. And so he said that uh, they, don't, they don't tax your, you know, military pension, you know. And so the same way, you know, when I got out. So anyway, that's how I found out about it. That's why a lot of veterans settle here because they don't tax their pension. So, so did you retire from the military? No, no. I, got, I just got out. I, I got discharged. I, like I said, I served four years and ten months. So I, I just... Took it, took my discharge, went home, and uh, sorted out some things I wanted to do. And for about four years, I kind of ambled through. I ended up working in a factory in the in the town where I grew up, of Hanover, Illinois. But I knew I didn't want to work in the factory for the rest of my life, so uh, I decided to go back to school. And uh, it was hard, but I'm, you know, I got through it and uh, got, uh, you know, I wasn't, a, I, I didn't do as well as I could have, but I got through. That's the main thing that I cared about. I didn't care about maintaining a 4.0 grade point average. I just wanted to, uh, you know, be a good student and uh, get a degree and end up with a good job. And I did, so. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you feel <clears throat> we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? Yeah, I think they ought to change. They changed the law in 83 for veterans. 1983 if you didn't sign up by a certain date you weren't eligible for military benefits so i'm in that classification as category nine and they've been trying to repeal the law so they say that's one of the things with government bureaucracy they they pass that law because so many veterans are going through the system well it's even worse now because of afghanistan and iraq so anyway i just wish they would repeal that law luckily I mean, I'm a veteran and I served. I'm like the other people in Category 9. You know, I think we should, I think we deserve the VA benefits. But luckily, I mean, I'd rather see somebody else who deserves it, you know, that's been injured. And, you know, luckily I'm in good health and so I don't need it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't like to be part of the VA system later, you know, for something that happens down the road. So anyway, that's that's the only, that's the only thing I wish they would change is that law. And, and the guy that um, is our VA, coordinator in, in Macomb agrees with me. He was a sergeant major for 30 years. You know, he thinks it's un-American. So, so there's, there's quite a few in that category that I'm in. And so everybody else that served, you know, gets the benefits and things like that. But like I said, <clears throat> I'm in, I'm in good health. So I don't, uh, I don't hold it against the people that, you know, are, are deserving. So that's one thing about the VA hospital. When I drive out there, I see people who are you know, a lot worse off than I am. So I'm glad the VA takes care of them. Of course, there's been a lot of backlash lately about the debacle in Phoenix and different places, you know, because they covered up a bunch of stuff and a lot of veterans didn't get the coverage they needed and died unnecessarily. But, I mean, there's flaws in every system, so hopefully they'll get it corrected. Okay. Well, at this time, um, I'd like to thank you for serving our country. You're and I would also like to thank you for giving me the honor to interview you. It was my pleasure.
And I'm sure we would like to thank you too. Oh, you're welcome. So it's pretty easy. Okay. So I usually say what I think. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have to hesitate. What was that name of that town? You said you 